started. So thank you everyone for coming to what is now the 24th event of the Disrupting Disruptions Feminist and Accessible Publishing, Communications, and Technologies Practices Speaker Workshop Series. This is also our first event of season two, so welcome. We're excited to have you here. I'm Dr. Alex Ketchum, and I'm a professor of feminist and social justice studies here at McGill and the organizer of this series. This series seeks to bring together scholars, creators, and people in industry working at the intersections of digital humanities, computer science, feminist studies, disability studies, communication studies, LGBTQ studies, history, and critical race theory. This series brings forward critical approaches to publishing practices, communication strategies, and techniques for making research dissemination more accessible. Season two will build on the themes of the earlier series but we'll also ask questions about sustainability, maintenance, right to repair, and the power of speculative futures. The series will be divided into three major themes. So we're going to continue from season one and thinking about the challenges for feminist and accessible publishing and technologies. Part two, we'll also be thinking about sustaining social justice and what that means around issues of sustainability, right to repair, the environment, and maintenance. And the third part is toolkits, which will be workshops applying the lessons of the speaker series. So we hope to see you at our events also next year. As we seek to draw attention to power relations that have been invisibilized, it is important to acknowledge Canada's long colonial history and current political practices. We are currently located on unceded Ganyangahaga territory. Furthermore, the ongoing organizing efforts at Unistodan make clear the ever-present and ongoing colonial violence in Canada. Interwoven with this historic colonization is one of enslavement and racism. This university's namesake, James McGill, owned slaves. These histories are here with us in this room and inform the kinds of conversations that we have today. The series was made possible thanks to our many funders, a special thanks to the IGSF, Milieu, the Indigenous Futures Lab, the Intersectionality Research Hub, MUA, the Black Feminist Futures Working Group, Cinema Politica, and more. You can see the full list of our funders on the website. As well, please check out our website and social media for a list of upcoming talks. Our next event is Gabrielle Coleman next week on March 18th, speaking about alt-right for synonymous, a critical comparison. Our website URL redirect is disruptingdisruptions.com. And we also have videos of past events and information of future events shared on that website. And this event will also be put on the website, um, hopefully within the next couple of days. So if you have any friends who want to see it, they can check it out. All of our events are free to attend and open to the public. So now for today's event. Rick Heave Tespe is a PhD student in the program of Integrated Neuroscience at McGill University. Her research investigates biological and behavioral factors that contribute to elevated sleep disturbances in youth with autism. Tespe's scientific projects involve analyzing large-scale genomic and longitudinal sleep data. She also collaborates with researchers and families to develop novel approaches to clear the diversity of perspectives and voices of youth with autism in scientific research. Outside of the lab, Tess Fay is a science communicator who creates audio stories and is an advocate for diversity and inclusion in STEM. She is the founder and is the executive producer of Broad Science, which she'll be speaking about today. Rakeem is also a vocal supporter for accessible science communication training for graduate students. She currently sits on the organizing committee for ComSciCon Canada, the first Canada-wide science communication conference for graduate students. So please join me in welcoming for Keep Test Day. Which is the format of today's event will be a little bit different. Rakeem is going to give a talk, and then we're going to do a fireside chat to kind of open up some more questions, and then we'll have audience questions after. Great, thanks. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you so much, Alex, for inviting me here today and for all the work that you've done in organizing this incredible series. We haven't taken a look at the list of speakers. They're absolutely mind-blowing compared to whatever was here last or a few weeks ago. And so that's, I mean, back when I'm here, thank you. Um, and cheers for also elaborating on James McGill. Always uh, appreciate it. So um, as Alex mentioned, uh, I'm, a, I'm a PhD student here at McGill, um, and I'm going to be talking more about, uh, I guess, my side hustle, <laughs> my night shift work, <laughs> um, which is as a science communicator, um, and the lessons that I've learned um, as someone who uh, had no idea about uh, the path that science communication would take me on, and the lessons that I've learned 
through broad science, um, very much as a non-expert um, in the field. Um, I'm going to give a brief overview of what broad science is for those of you um, who haven't heard of it before. Um, also, thank you all for coming. <laughs> Cheers. Um, so broad science uh, currently has three ongoing projects. The first uh, is the podcast uh, series, which are episodes that take a deep dive on a science topic and look at the intersection of uh, science and society, rather science in society. Um, and these narratives are driven by uh, the voices and perspectives of historically underrepresented folks uh, within the sciences. And the second is that we host uh, storytelling events uh, at the Phi Center with Confabulation, which is, for those of you from the MOF, uh, Confabulation is, is the Canadian version of the MOF. It's been running for 10 years now. And these storytelling events occur, um, as I mentioned, at the Phi Center. Um, and it's a way for researchers, scientists, people involved in STEM uh, to tell true personal stories on stage. And uh, these are recorded and put on uh, our podcasts as well. And then the third project that is ongoing is our youth workshops. So we work with um, kiddos around Montreal uh, we mainly uh, try to work with uh, underserved areas here in Montreal uh, and we get students to come in and do a, a full day workshop about why communicating science is important. Uh, they get to learn some science journalism skills. Uh, they are paired with a researcher where they create questions for them. They learn some audio production skills at CKUT, which, uh, which is where we're housed um, at the community radio station here at McGill. And then they get to interview a scientist on the radio. And that is something that has a podcast. So those are, uh, in brief, the three ongoing projects. And as you can see, audio ties all of them together. They're all made accessible as podcasts. Um, and I'll, I'll go more in depth uh, with, those pod, uh, with those projects, rather, um, as the talk goes along. And before, um, I begin with those lessons that we've learned in the projects, I have to say that none of this is possible. I wouldn't be here without an extraordinary team and group of people. So everything that I'm talking about today, uh, I am physically telling you about it, and, uh, but it, it has come from the immense hard work and often unpaid work of, of the people who are passionate about these projects. Um, so I'd like to thank my partner, Elisa over there, who hosts uh, broad science with me um, and our funders and furnace. Okay. So before I get into depth of the projects, I want to talk a little bit about why broad science started. So it's something that I like to refer to as uh, converging frustrations. So for me, uh, growing up, I kind of weirdly always knew that I wanted to be a scientist in some way. Uh, and my parents were incredibly supportive of that. I would make them uh, take me to this, the Ontario Science Museum pretty much as much as possible. Um, and you know, the further up I got within schooling and academia, I started to realize that um, there weren't a lot of people that looked like me within uh, STEM-related courses that I was taking. Uh, nor my professors or teachers. And so when I came here to McGill, um, my thought process was very much do the work, be quiet, get good grades, you'll make it. I've gotten pretty far with that kind of mentality, right? Um, and something strange started to happen when I got into my master's. I started to begin questioning this idea that science was objective. This objectivity, this um, kind of idea that there are no inherent biases within the scientific process. This came from courses where I was uh, learning about mouse models about chronic pain, for instance, that disproportionately impacts women. 
And yet, most of these studies that I was reading were on male mice. Was it okay that female mice models were not included because of difficulties including or controlling for menstrual cycles? Was that okay? Um, was it okay that I was working on large scale data sets that included um, high SES families, middle class families, predominantly European families? Was I, and was my research benefiting the communities that I grew up with and the people that had made me who I am today? And in fact, I work in a field where in genetics, our genome-wide association studies up to this point, 80% of them um, include participants of European ancestry who make up a fraction of our world population. So I was doing what science was telling me to do. I was critically thinking, and, I, and, and it was terrifying, <laughs> right? And so this path to critical thinking and kind of rejecting this notion of objectivity led me to start understanding some of the accessibility issues that we were having in having this research disseminated um, and be engaged with within communities. Um, and not just in terms of misinformation and uh, the lack of actual access, but from the stories that we were hearing in the media. So at this time, in parallel to, to my research, I began, I became very interested in science communication, just writing from school newspapers and blogs, and I was learning from these incredible sources, particularly podcasts that I really enjoyed listening to, things like Radio Lab and other, insert other science podcasts. Um, and something that was striking was how much it mirrored the issues of diversity within the production of science, right? Who were telling, who was telling these science stories? And I don't mean just the scientists, the lack of diversity within the, of scientists and the stories themselves, but the fact that every time you would come across diversity within these stories, there was always something quite sinister or not right. There was like a deficit, something was wrong. It was never from a framework of empowerment. Um, and then also starting to think, well, why should some of these communities engage with scientists? Genuinely. Um, yeah, so that master's was pretty heavy. That, <laughs> that's what I started to think about. Um, and with a, a friend of mine in my, in my program and, and another friend uh, at, at McGill, we started to think of ways that we can maybe address these issues in our kind of own small parts. And the question that kept on coming up within our conversations were, how can we dismantle a very dominant and marginalizing, currently occurring, marginalizing STEM culture? And not just how do we create room for ourselves in that culture, right? And so one way that we had thought was, hey, why don't we start creating stories of science stories that we want to hear, the stories that we weren't finding, and the stories that were representative of the communities that we grew up with and that we knew and that we, we wanted to hear and that they wanted to hear. Um, and so we thought of storytelling as an active tool of resistance towards this culture. Um, I mean, admittedly, <laughs> we went into it thinking, how hard could it be to just create a podcast that's NPR quality with people <laughs> who have never done any audio production before? Um, <laughs> it's, it's hard. Um, but. Uh, audio and, and, and radio and podcasting immediately struck us as the right outlet and venue, given how democratized it is. And if you think about it, podcasting is a, a medium that uh, is quite easy to disseminate in terms of not needing a lot of money to host. 
uh, not needing uh, licensing, um, and also radio being one of the most accessible formats of, of media around the world. Um, so to us, that was kind of the right outlet. And then, of course, storytelling. It's our social currency. It is rooted in our history. It is rooted in our understanding and our knowledge. Um, it is ingrained in us as humans. So to us, it is something that brings us together and something that we all have ownership over and something that we do daily. And we thought that would be a perfect kind of vesicle to start building bridges and, and breaking some of those walls within uh, the science community. Of course, there has been, we did not know this when we first started, but of course there is research um, showing that using storytelling within science to engage public audiences makes it more relatable, understandable, persuasive, all of the things that we know in our everyday lives. So rather than using what is referred to in research as the deficit theory, which is saying, you still don't understand the concept, I'm gonna chuck more things at you, more information, just throw that at you. We know that doesn't work. And storytelling is one potential way. It isn't the only way, but it is one way. And of course, our brains have a natural affinity for narratives. Um, I think it would be awesome to have a, an, another talk about neuroscience and storytelling. I'm not going to get into it because we get really excited about it. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to, to give a shout out to uh, a very new podcast called Shortwave by NPR, hosted by Maddie Sophia. And I would um, love for you to all take a listen. And there was a recent episode called Your Brain on Storytelling with uh, Liz Neely, who's the executive director of Story Collider, and she goes into um, concepts like neurocoupling and, and uh, transportation and, and, and why storytelling is, um, and what, what is happening biologically to us uh, when we listen to stories. And it's a really fantastic summary episode. Um, so I would highly suggest it. I also uh, was listening to Shortwave this morning, and speaking of storytelling uh, in, I mean, it's beautifully produced, but. They, uh, they had an episode on uh, coronavirus and uh, the racism that comes along with the narratives that are currently in the media and the historical racism and xenophobia that has been attached to viruses and disease spread, uh, not only uh, uh, regarding the Chinese community, but of many uh, uh, historically um, kind of oppressed communities. Um, so, again, just a shout out to that really amazing episode, which is similar to what we're trying to emulate, to be honest. Now, one thing that when we were creating the concept of broad science that was incredibly important to us within this storytelling framework was this idea of intersectionality. So, how are different identities, geographies, or experiences relate uh, to how we interact with scientific uh, research and science within society. Um, and this is very much taken from, uh, pretty much a lot of things it's taken from, is black feminism. Um, it is uh, the, the root of, well, I mean, the coined term from Professor Kimberly Crenshaw um, in the 70s is using intersectionality, and, and this is the root of what we want to do as a lens to question power. To question power dynamics within not just scientific findings, but all stakeholders involved within, uh, within the scientific process, which includes the people who are being affected by that research. We wanted to use intersectionality to increase representation of marginalized folks within our stories. And importantly, we wanted to, to humanize the scientific process. That science is everyday life. Um, and that 
it would that broad science ultimately would serve as a platform to amplify the voices of community members um, but also to create human connection and something that has been most important to me and, and uh, I'll talk about it through the lessons learned is this idea of co-creating um, and so we did have a series of things or like kind of set um, points that we wanted to hit with broad science, but ultimately it has transformed and changed for the better because we included our community to give us guidance as to what they wanted to hear. And lastly, we wanted to approach all of our stories and everything that we did within audio storytelling through this lens of empowerment rather than deficit. And that is inherently tied to this idea of co-creation. How can we empower our communities to hear and tell the stories that they want to hear? So we technically started in 2017, although these ideas have been brewing for a while uh, before then. And since then, we've released a, a few episodes. And so these are more longer, uh, like I said, deep dive episodes of about an hour. Um, and we tackle topics from the Me Too movement in STEM to uh, direct-to-consumer testing and how that has impacted um, African Americans, indigenous folks here, particularly with quantum, uh, quantum law. Um, we tackle mental health issues in, in, in graduate studies. Um, and I'm going to play a brief trailer of our social life of DNA, which was a part two, uh, two part brother uh, episode that we did. Join us this October for the first season of Broad Science, where we wind our way through the complicated social life of DNA. In my mind, limiting the definition of an indigenous person to DNA only is a very colonial concept. During the series, we look into the billion dollar industry of direct to consumer DNA testing. The relationship between science and their ideology is a very urgent topic for a lot of white nationalists. I think they're looking for ways to justify what they see as truth. We ask, how did it get popular so quickly? Why do diverse groups of people use them? And what can those percentages really tell us about us? Why would African Americans in particular be willing to put a tissue sample in a FedEx envelope and send it to a laboratory and expect that this space of scientific analysis and inference could send back to them reliable information about who they are. We'll hear personal narratives about DNA and identity. His article was HuffPost right or horrified to find out that he was white, which was not true. I'm not horrified to find out that I'm white at all. I was surprised. We also asked leading academics in the field who shed some light on the impact of DNA testing on our society. They appropriated the land, they appropriated the mineral resources, now they're trying to appropriate our DNA or our biological resources into their settler claims to own and control and have the right to everything. I'm just going to stop it there. Um, that was, we ended on Dr. Kim Talbert, who, if you do not know, please immediately just leave my talk and just go Google. <laughs> um, and and as, you, as you heard from the trailer, I mean, we do have a wealth of academic experts um, who come onto the podcast, um, but we do also um, value, and I'll get to this, uh, our community members who are not seen as academic experts and, and who provide valuable insight to these stories. Um, you know, when we started, and I'm going to focus this talk more on the lessons that we've learned rather than a workshop on, on tools and, and tips that, you know, that I'm more than happy to share these. But it was really hard for us because we had volunteers who were mainly students, graduate students, who were used to this, who were used to this very restrictive triangle of background, methods, results, conclusion. 
I mean, it is not really conducive to wanting to engage with science, right? And so we had to, we really had to learn how to be journalists. Um, and this was, this, this is a process that is still ongoing and I don't think will ever end. Uh, but it, it really took a lot for us to understand. First, we need to think about why do people care? What's the so what, right? And in terms of scripting for audio, I mean, every single word counts. Here we are, some graduate students using things like, well, they positively correlated with one another, the other, and there's a positive association, and we use this X regression model. Why? Like, it, I mean, it's not to say that, you know, when you're conveying scientific information through storytelling that you're dumbing it down by using different language. But we had to reprogram the ways, and we still do, and Elisa always catches me on this, reprogram the way that we uh, start kind of communicating and, and, and picking words to use. Um, and the cat was representative of me learning how to mix. <laughs> <laughs> that's not an actual, that's not how you mix. But, um, but the, the technical aspect was an incredibly steep learning curve, and that's why I'm so grateful to have uh, community radio stations like CKDT who are so underappreciated and so undervalued and you know don't have enough money and yet they keep on trucking. Um, and so that was, so this whole process is continuing but it's been a very steep learning curve. Um, and the water was just the same. If you've ever heard yourself on radio without water, it's a horrifying experience. <laughs> um, <laughs> but truly, for me, the, the, the main takeaways from creating these episodes have been our stakeholders. Um, and going back to what I had mentioned is we value every single type of expertise. We do not put academics on a pedestal when it comes to creating our stories. Um, and that we recognize that there are different forms of expertise and that lived experience is one that should be valued equally. Um, not all of the people who uh, have helped us with the episodes are, are on the actual podcast. Many of them choose to remain anonymous, uh, particularly for the uh, uh, Me Too episode that we did. We uh, got amazing uh, guidance and feedback for many people who came forward as survivors who wanted to help in the construction of the episode. Um, in terms of um, for one of our episodes on uh, DNA and the impact on indigenous communities from Canada, I mean, we had to cultivate relationships for over six months, um, and we had to earn that trust. Um, you know, we we couldn't take for granted um, our identities as 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 being one where there would be initial trust based on that, um, and so it was an incredible learning journey of humility for us. Um, and I think for all of us in the room, when we have friends or acquaintances or, or anyone tell us stories that are incredibly personal, um, it is an immense privilege to be hearing them. And so um, we did not take that lightly. And this idea of telling your own stories, how you want in your own time, it really goes back to, um, if you don't want to be on the radio, that's fine. But what we want is, how do you feel you can best be supported to engage and to, to help guide us and, and help guide uh, an episode uh, in the way that you would be proud to hear or be involved with, right? So, we haven't put out an episode in a year because uh, people have graduated, we're, we're based on volunteers, I had my comps last year, so it, we, had to, we had to put a stop um, on the episodes. And it, it is quite technical, and I just also want to give a shout out to Ryan McFarland. If you hear our episode from uh, 
the first episode till now, the mixing is mind-blowing. Uh, he does a wonderful job at it. Um, but we're really excited because this month we're releasing, uh, I don't know if this is the title that's going to stick, but here's the, here's the working one for now. We're releasing uh, an episode on AI and ethics. Uh, and I mean, this is to, uh, an all-star cast of people who have helped us with this episode. Um, on the right, my right, your left, uh, Dr. Timit Gebru, who uh, is now a, an AI, um, who works in AI for Google, uh, who also, had I known there was an Ethiopian AI person, my gosh, I don't, I, I think I would be an AI right now. <laughs> and my mom is particularly stoked for this episode. Um, and so, you know, we also, in addition to these incredible uh, academic guests, and also, uh, I will point out, Surya Matu, who uh, got the Pulitzer, or who was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize in 2016 for his team's ProPublica report of uh, machine bias, which was, I believe, the first ever large-scale report of, um, of, of AI being used biasly. So this story was of, of algorithm that was being used in courts across America to predict recidivism rates. And I think as we can all guess, uh, those recidivism rates were uh, very suspicious in terms of who they were picking um, would recommit crimes, um, so mainly black folks. Uh, and so we uh, have various experts from journalists, data scientists, to academics. Uh, but one of my favorite parts of this episode is we went to a machine learning conference here in Montreal, because we're, we're really big on that. Um, and we sat with a group of young students, undergraduates, in computer science and asked them, what has been your education and your experience so far with ethics? And it was terrifying. Um, so we will be releasing that this month. Uh, these are some photos from our story evenings with confabulation. And I mean, these are just extraordinary nights because we have about sometimes up to 200 people packed into the Phi Center, listening to scientists, people involved with STEM, tell true personal stories in a way that is engaging and kind of in a way that isn't uh, kind of associated with a scientist, which is what we do in an ivory tower. And they're very raw and we laugh and we cry. And it's a really, really amazing event. Um, but something that to me has been uh, wonderful to see is with the diversity of our speakers also came the diversity of our audiences. So we were starting to see folks who had never come to the show. We were starting to see different ethnicities being at the show. And so I think it speaks a lot to, um, yeah, inclusivity. And, and also, we create a lot of these relationships, not just asking people to tell stories, but over a year, helping and kind of supporting them in crafting their stories. Um, and so this been, is, again, it's been an incredible experience and I'm happy to have partnered with Confabulation for this. Um, so this is an example of a story from uh, an incredible PhD candidate, Maya Hay at Concordia University, who studies uh, fermentation and its uh, interactions or kind of the intersection between fermentation and, and humans. Um, I'll just read out this quote. It's oh, it always seems like a very benign question. Would you like bread for breakfast or rice for breakfast? But I know, as a five-year-old child, that that question sizes me up on my Japanese-ness. I don't fit into any culture. I'm not white, I'm not Asian, I'm not other. The thing is, my folks don't fit into one category either. And she goes on to explain some of her research with microbes and, and fermentation. But here, you know, when you're when you're talking about research and you're talking about microbes, and that's the first word you hear. 
immediately there's going to be this barrier that comes up for many folks. Um, whether or not, even scientists who are not within this field, right? Um, and so the beauty of this story is kind of Maya's taking us in a journey that we all understand. It's isolation. It's not belonging. It's not fitting in. And immediately creates this dialogue and this conversation for us to want to learn more. Not only about her research, but about her. Um, so, I mean, these are the types of stories that are being told. Um, is amazing. You can hear Maya's full story on our podcast as well. Um, and I thought I would just do a plug. <laughs> so we, we have our next stories of growth, um, theme is growth rather, um, on April 11th at 7.30 um, if you're interested in showing up. So there have been a few surveys that have done, been done to scope the uh, perceptions of science and science uh, communication within Canada, um, and done by 3M, the Ontario Science Center. Um, and you know there are some some numbers that um, regarding controversial topics like GMO and and, and so on, but. Some of, some of the ones that really stuck up stuck out to me were those regarding belonging. So this fact that 52% of Canadians pulled in the survey couldn't name a female scientist, or the fact that 44% of Canadians think of scientists as elitists, you know, not people that at your grocery store, people that sit beside you on the bus. And despite all of this, an overwhelming amount of Canadians still want to engage with science and the scientific process. And so, to me, I'm thinking of all of this has to start somewhere. And it probably starts in these kind of feelings of uh, distancing from science at a very young age. Um, and so, how? Can we collectively within the STEM community create or, or help, sorry, foster um, individuals who feel that they can be engaged in not just within STEM fields, but just within the, the process of, <laughs> of, of science throughout their lifespan, um, but also not lose that creativity along the way and the curiosity that comes along with just being a kid who's interested in everything. Um, and so that's where we thought uh, storytelling and then podcasting could be used as a tool um, to do so. And so we, that's why we created the Broad Science Youth Workshop. Uh, it is more than just youth interviewing scientists. It really is a whole um, process of first understanding what, what are the kids interested in? What type of things do they want to learn? Who can we connect them with that might facilitate that learning? And so we find professors, graduate students um, to partake, and we have them do a bio sketch. We have them do like an initial write up of what they're doing, what they're interested in, not only in the lab, but outside the lab. Um, and that has been a really interesting process to try to get uh, science scientists to break down their work, and that has actually taken a lot of time. <laughs> um, and then, you know, we we have these in-depth, amazing conversations with kiddos who are about as young as eight to teenagers who are about to become adults, from seventeen, about their perceptions of science, uh, their understanding of of dissemination, and, and they talk about incredibly complex things. They talk about why, why do we have to pay to access science? Um, and again, a host of other things. And so we have these conversations, and throughout the workshop, they then get to create questions for their scientists, they learn about research skills, um, and then ultimately, 
they engage with the scientists not just about their work, but about the person, the human, and their stories. Um, about and something that we emphasize a lot is about having them be exposed to failures, because ultimately, as scientists, that is what we do: is we fail and we fail and we fail, and then one percent of the time, something gets published. Jacob on CKUT 90.3 FM. Today we are with Dr. Chung on the topic of artificial intelligence and language. My sister was reading this book and she read part of it to me. It was called Future You by Andy Walker. And there was this interesting part that anyone who has a microchip or pacemaker counts as a cyborg. So would that technically mean that robots are alive? halfway, or would that mean just that humans are half robot? One thing that's interesting, I won't go into the, the response, but that's an actually, that's an incredibly complex question, right? For a 10 year old to be asking, to be concerned about what, what does technology mean for us inherently as humans? Uh, that is a philosophical question that people are doing their PhDs on. Um, and so, you know, through this process, what I've loved about this program is how youth have, can let their creativity roam and kind of ask any questions that you might not get the opportunity to do so in the class. Um, but here they are kind of exploring things that they're curious about and want to know more about and having experts engage with them in a way that is respectful and, and saying, hey, that is a great question. Let's flesh that out a little bit more. And you know, more so than that, you know, we get, uh, we've had students who have asked to learn more about a specific topic because they've had family members who were impacted uh, by certain diseases or, um, um, or that they're concerned about the environment. We get a lot of kids who are concerned about the environment. And here is, a place for them to discuss that not only with these scientists, but with their peers in a way that is kind of not restricted uh, as a classroom set setting. And, and through this process, they're, they're empowered to figure out and, and to learn, about their, uh, to kind of drive their own curiosity for science, um, which, which has been really amazing to see. And so, so far we have, um, Done, we have worked rather with 70 kids, um, and uh, it's mainly been in the Montreal area. And this past 2019, we did our first international broad science uh, in Germany, uh, which uh, was really awesome because here's the thing I mean, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. This is a kind of you, you know, you have your iPhone, you have radio stations all over the world in the middle of the ocean. That's really cool. I love how that can... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it in the middle of the ocean on a boat. But um, I think the concept here is, can be implemented in many other places, and that's what we're working on right now, is creating open source tools um, for anyone to use this. Um, yeah, and, and when I say one of the biggest lessons that we've learned is to not reinvent the wheel, is to collaborate. We collaborate with many organizations here in Montreal, um, but we have also learned that uh, there are other folks who are doing similar projects around the world, and, and we learn from them as well. And I think the number one takeaway from this project is that the capabilities of youth are, are endless, and that we really need to start talking about early exposure to intersectionality and increasing our kind of celebration of failing and failures um, because that inaccessibility and that elitism is very much rooted from very early early age when you're sitting in a classroom and all you're hearing is Einstein, people have done incredible things. That is not how science works. Okay, so to wrap up, Main takeaway is just be humble. It's, you're gonna, it's a trial and error process. You're going to fail. You're going to fail again. 
and it's gonna repeat. And if you're not failing, you're doing something wrong. And that's ultimately kind of the process that we have gone through. Um, that storytelling can be used in a, as an accessible tool of engagement. Um, and also, oftentimes, it might not be the right tool of engagement, and this know the context in your audience. In what you're doing, how are you including empowerment and intersectionality within your works? And that very much is tied into how are you co-creating, and how is your engagement bi-directional? So I don't, something that I did not mention is that with every program, even with our kiddos, we get feedback. We genuinely want to know that goes into collect, collecting data. We want to know what can we do to make our program better. And they are our biggest stakeholder in all of this. Um, and so we want to stray away from collecting data as how many people came to our events. Or, I mean, to me, I've kind of been always transparent about this program isn't meant for us creating new diverse people in the STEM workforce, which would be great. But ultimately what I want is, do these youth feel empowered? Do these youth feel like they belong? And is that going to be sustained for them to be engaged citizens throughout their lifespan? So with that, I've gone well over time. I am so sorry. <laughs> I've just rambled. Um, I'll leave some of the, the shout outs to later on maybe. Um, and I have some resources if you do. Uh, if you would like to learn more about the science journalism and, and other kind of resources that we've turned to, um, but I'll leave it. I'll leave it there for now. Okay. Thank you so much. We're going to test if the mic works okay. Oh, please. Do you want to? Yeah. Better. And if it does. <laughs> Can everyone hear okay? Okay, I think we'll just pass it back. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm going to kick us off with a couple of questions and then we'll open up to audience. So I have about five ish questions. So, um, and feel free to answer these as you wish and okay. you know, go on whatever tangents you like. Yeah. Um, so, through organizing broad science and in your work, what do you think is key to communicating research and making research accessible? Not just for those as science communicators, but to a larger research. <laughs> all right, I do want to look at all of your lovely faces, but I am going to just go directly to the mic here. Um, so I think, I mean, it's, it's something that I spoke about in, in the talk itself, but it, it really has to be co-created. I think that we need to move away from this framework or this idea that we need to, to dictate science. Um, and it's more so a process of continual engagement and creating and it's meant to be bi-directional. And that's where I think we need to go. Wonderful. This question kind of follows up on the last one. So we've seen a push from Canadian federal research funding bodies, so from the science that the NSERC or the medical research that CIHR or SHRC for the humanities and social sciences. And so these federal research bodies have really been starting to push public dissemination of the research. But often that means that pieces are just journal, academic journal pieces that are published now either in open access form or in repositories. So where do you see, if you see, this gap between open and actual science communication? <laughs> sort of a question. Um, well, I think it ultimately, so it, yeah, CIHR and NSHRC and, and all those running agencies also using interchangeable terms, knowledge mobilization, knowledge translation, um, for, for this type of dissemination. Ultimately, I think it boils down to who is the audience that you, you, you need to connect with. Because if it's scientists and you're putting articles on open science, and that's great, you've disseminated and you've done your knowledge translation to other scientists. But I think, you know, if your mission is to go beyond that of the traditional sources who are able to readily ex access science, then open, open science is as good as, all right, I'm going to go and read this article. Who is going to help me understand how this benefits me? Um, and is this the right form of dissemination? Um, or can others be taken? 
Um, so I really do think it's a matter of understanding who your audience is and what is the what is the impact that you want to get out of your research. And if it's just having it open for other scientists to read, then I guess that's that's what it is. But I think we need to go beyond that. So even in that answer, you started to speak to my next question. So this is great. <laughs> Uh, so there seems to be this kind of divide right then between science and science communicators. Oftentimes, right, a lot of podcasts that we hear, science podcasts, they're not people who are necessarily trained in sciences and so forth. Um, so why do you think, if you do, and I don't want to put any words in your mouth, that's important that scientists themselves are also doing this work? Yeah. Um, okay. So I, I do think it's important that scientists get trained to have some baseline level of communication. I, I, I can't kind of highlight how uh, this is needed and, and how necessary this is. However, with that being said, science communication is a, is a skill. It is a um, profession for many. And I think that it's quite difficult to now start to ask of scientists to be communicators who A, do not have the training, and B, who are researchers, who are writing grants, who are teaching, and who, are, who already have a full workload. And so I think that needs to come with a lot of support. So I think first we need buy-in, which we don't have currently from institutions and the academics, to understand the importance of translating the work. And then secondly, we need to, sh to show up and have the funding and the actual uh, structure and the resources to support them in doing so. Um, and also, I should mention that sometimes scientists aren't the person to be communicating the work. Sometimes it's actually harmful for these scientists to be in certain communities doing this work. So I think it's also understanding when is it the right time to be engaging with scientists in community. Awesome. So my next question is going to kind of follow up on the like labor aspect of what you're talking about. Yeah. So. Um, so you've spoken about science's lack of accessibility and the dominant and marginalizing STEM culture. Like your podcast episode, for example, on Me Too and STEM was super powerful. Um, and there's also this question of labor here too. Um, your project's amazing, obviously, at amplifying a diversity of voices in science, but at the same time, projects such as these are super labor intensive, as you mentioned, and is probably apparent to everyone in this room here, and hopefully people watching later. Um, so I'm wondering if you can speak to balancing the labor of your work with broad science and the traditional research demands as a PhD candidate. <laughs> I do <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, mean, you know, it, well, I mean, it's, it's the actual truth is that a lot of us do make sacrifices uh, to do the work that we're doing, and oftentimes, um, Graduate students have been at the forefront of pushing science communication here in Canada and around around the world, really. Um, and so, oftentimes, a lot of unfair burden gets placed on them to to do this type of work, um, which is often unpaid. So, you know, something that I have started to do recently is ask to be paid for my work, uh, which has been incredibly uncomfortable. And <laughs> but and, and and as as graduate students, you're honestly not taught to value. To value your work and to value it in terms of currency that people understand, which is money. Um, so the end of negotiating or you know being told that what you do is valued and, and deserves to be paid is, is a kind of foreign concept to a lot of us. So it's been a steep learning curve, and I think um, within the past year, also just learning how to say no to a lot of things and opportunities come up, which are amazing. But um, you know, if I need to take a hiatus for a year, which is what we did, then we need to do that. Because um, I think number one is for certain sanity <laughs> and our mental health, but also being valued. So the balance I'm still working on, but yeah. Thank you for the frankness in that answer. Um, so um, can you talk about how you started that relationship with CQ, CKUT, sorry, CKUT? Um, I also promised them that I would give a shout out plug too. Oh, yeah. um, oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, but um, that if you want to volunteer with them, they have a form on their website. Um, if you Google their name it, and put volunteer form, it should come right up. And it's free for all McGill students, by the way. So this is a free service. I mean, it's not. I mean, pay for it. 
uh, you opt in to pay for it, but it is uh, a resource that is available to you. And it's, uh, I believe, a minimal cost for like $10 to community members as well. So. And they have tours um, listed on the website to check it out more and more. Um, but how did you start that relationship? Um, and can you talk about how, well, I, yeah, we'll go with that because you kind of answered the second part. Um, so I think I mentioned a little earlier in the talk that I started doing uh, science communication through just writing for the student newspaper uh, when I first came in, so like the daily and writing blogs. Um, and then through there, one of my stories involved uh, an audio piece, and I was immediately hooked. Uh, so I became a volunteer there. Uh, but it, it, also, a lot of the audio stuff that I was doing uh, wasn't science related at the time as well. So I thought, hey, this would be really cool. Of mixture of my two worlds between this journalism that I was doing and, and, and the research. Um, but mainly, I, again, I, I can't uh, state enough how much of a brilliant resource community radio is, and they, and they, they helped me a lot in terms of the baseline skills of, of uh, learning how to edit and, and work the really scary uh, technology that was there. And, um, and then from there, you just kind of spend your weekends on YouTube somehow. And just, uh, I mean, most of it is, uh, I'm not going to use that word, I'll, I'll retract my own thought. Uh, but most of it is like not great stuff. But what we did is like just on YouTube and learn how to edit and, and, and learn kind of uh, soft, I guess, sound engineering. But yeah, no, it's, uh, it's a good piece, awesome. Yeah. So I guess alongside that, um, like any tips for people, especially with the learning curve that you've had, um, if, for people who do want to get into science communication, especially audio storytelling. So audio storytelling, um, community, go to your community radio station. Can I actually jump on to, yeah, I want to do a shout out, which includes resources for, for students. Yes. <laughs> I'm being a rebel here. Um, but yeah, so, like I had mentioned, there aren't a lot of um, there aren't a lot of uh, resources for students to get trained in science communication, whether it be through audio. Um, I would say, if you are interested in audio specifically, pretty much every campus has a radio station. Um, but ComSciCon Canada uh, and Alex is also part, uh, co-organizer of that. It is a recently um, it is a recent science communication conference for graduate students, um, and you know, there you learn it's free. By the way, uh, it's all free. It's funded by all major institutions here in Canada, uh, and so so on. And there you can gain an understanding of the different types of science communication. So journalism, science policy, education, um, and this is a model that was based off of. Uh, the American ComSci College started in 2013 at Harvard University. So this is an incredible um, organization to, to kind of get started. Um, and in terms of just science communication, I want to shout out some incredible uh, conferences that you can go to. So Inclusive SciComm uh, here is a, a conference that was started, I believe, in 2017 at Rhode Island. Um, and they, this conference is all about how to make science communication training inclusive, and it has incredible opportunities for students, graduate students, undergraduate students, um, and I think this is a brilliant place to go if you're looking for kind of more of an understanding of the scope of what's happening in science communication, um, and they've also published uh, um, some findings about this conference recently. Um, so, uh, a great place. Uh, another thing is uh, Falling Walls Engage. So this was uh, why we were in Germany last year. Uh, was This is a science and technology conference. And if you have an outreach uh, project, um, you can apply to Falling Walls Engage to pitch that outreach project. Um, and they fly you to Berlin. And, and it's an incredible experience where you get to meet science communicators from all over the world who are doing amazing things within their communities oftentimes very little resources. Um, so, you know, science communication as, as science is very English dominant, um, and I think this was just an incredible opportunity to see all the different ways uh, that science is being translated in uh, languages that are very much underrepresented in the sciences as well. 
Um, I'll leave this up here because I think this is a better slide to look at than Airborne. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I also just wanted to shout out the fact that we just had um, just released or was just released that there are um, young people in the sciences, eight to thirty years old, who were selected to be on the chief, the Canadian uh, Chief Scientist uh, Youth Advisory Committee, uh, which is Dr. Mona Neymar. Um and uh, these young people will be the will be representing our voices in terms of science in Canada, including uh, the integration of science communication and training within Canada. So I'm hoping there will be changes from this. Um, also disclosure that I was on the advisory committee for that as well. Um, but I think there's a lot of amazing things that are starting to happen, more so than when I was a master's student here. I can see the exponential change that has occurred. Um, so I'll come back to you now. <laughs> okay, so um, my last question is just um, how did, um, I know you said you work with different community groups, but how do kids get involved in the program? If you want to speak to that, and then after that we'll open up to audience questions, okay? Thank you. Um, so, one thing that I didn't mention, I'm looking directly at Dr. Allison Gonzalez and Dr. Diane Chuck, who can't be here, is uh, we've actually branched into uh, um, integrating broad science into research here at the Gill um, and understanding the, the impacts um, of the program uh, on, on people who, on, uh, I can't talk anymore, I'm like, oh, it's time to go to bed. Um, it, no, so we, yes, yeah, so we've branched into research and so we've worked with uh, school boards, let's be Pearson, though the, 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 sorry, AMSB, uh, school board. I'm like, that's for my research project. Um, <laughs> and, but we've also collaborated, like I said, uh, with many organizations uh, here in Montreal. So uh, we've worked with CESA, which is a, a, a wonderful community organization that services newly arrived refugees and immigrants uh, here in Montreal. Um, we work with uh, the Gananaque Education uh, um, uh, Organization. So we're actually doing uh, a workshop uh, for the high school, high school currently uh, to produce uh, um, podcasts about water um, and uh, access uh, to water. Um, so I mean, it's it's through existing organizations really. The first, I will say, the first time that we did this was through a Science Odyssey Week, which is like the Canadian. Uh, the government, Canadian government promoted week of science and like celebrating science in Canada, and we just had a, a Google Doc where people can sign up and it was first come first serve, and we immediately saw most of these families were very high SES, most of these families were white. So uh, as soon as we kind of started to work with people within the community, we started to diversify the, the reach of this program. Um, Audience questions? I was really curious about like how the scientists um, interacted with the youth um, workshops and whether you had feedback from like, their perspective of explaining their methods and like their work to younger kids. Because um, I imagine that would be really different than speaking at a conference. Um, but like what their, yeah, sort of just what their reflections were on that. that. Yeah, thank you. That's a really great question. Um, so when we first did this workshop, we didn't think about a lot of things. But one of the things that we didn't think about was the interaction between uh, a ten-year-old kid and a scientist. Like these scientists, and some of them were my friends, some of them were my professors, and so I'm like, oh, this is great. They're gonna come in. They're so great. And here you are, this ten-year-old who's been prepping a whole day to ask this researcher questions, and they look up and. We literally had one kid start shaking. Um, and, and so for us, what we do now is we have this meet and greet where we have a whole group of, uh, every, everyone involved in, in the uh, program and all the scientists, they sit down and they just chat and they talk and they get to know each other first and uh, they become more, uh, they become looser, right? Um, and then that's when we start to ask questions. So we didn't think about it, but the initial, just the initial contact 
uh, was an incredibly salient point for our program because this is, you know, this is when youth are, are for many of them, the first time they're meeting a scientist, for many of them also the first time they're meeting a scientist who looks like them and their family. So it, it was an incredibly pivotal moment and the feedback that we got from the youth uh, was really helpful in terms of structuring the meet and greet. Um, in terms of how the scientists, so that's why we introduced the bio sketch. <laughs> so the bio sketch was there because we now gave kind of a full description of who are you going to be talking to, what is their age, what are some of their interests, what are their names, and we give them a booklet of tips um, and things that you wouldn't even think about, but not even regards to breaking down the science, but things like say their name. That's a great question. Thank you so much. Right? Just little tips like that that you wouldn't you don't care about a conference, right? Um, and then in terms of the, the breaking down, we, we do work with scientists and we, we help edit their, uh, their bio sketches uh, to get them ready for, for that age group, but it is difficult. Thank you so much for your talk. It was really inspiring, the work that you're doing. Um, I was just wondering if you could just repeat the stat you shared earlier about, it was like 80% of the participants are made up of European descent. Um, yeah. And was it genome? Oh, so a genome-wide association analysis. So basically like a genetic study, right? But um, so what these studies are is uh, linking uh, variants within our genome, so um, uh, changes of base pairs uh, within our DNA that are related or associated to a certain trait or what we call phenotype. So uh, it's something like heart disease. Um, there's been one on educational attainment, although we're getting, up, again, up a, a talk for, for another time. But um, so it's, it's associating variations within our genome to, um, to different medical and behavioral traits. Okay. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much. I also think she's found that really, really interesting. Um, I just wanted to know if you could speak a little bit to the communication training that's being offered to scientists or uh, I understand that you're doing some of that work, like what you were just speaking about, but you were talking about there being a real lack of that happening uh, in the graduate programs, for example. So uh, I'm just wondering if you can speak a little bit about like what do you see that's currently sort of evolving and maybe what do you dream of? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no, thank you so much for your question. So it's, um, I mean, when I say we're behind, I think in terms of models compared to the UK, which is quite advanced in terms of integrating communication within uh, their training of scientists. Um, in terms of how it's evolved, we're now starting to see science communication offered as credited courses. Um, and I think last year was the first one uh, where Diane Deschef, uh who is uh, a lecturer here at McGill, uh, has a science communication course for graduate students. Um, but before that, I can only really think of um, things that were either kind of one-offs, like traditional like grant writing, or oral speaking, how to do a three-minute presentation. Um, so it, it really was kind of very restrictive towards academic settings. Um, but we're now starting to see communication being expanded to understanding that your work directly impacts policy, right? Your work directly impacts education. Your work directly impacts, you know, people's first-hand knowledge of scientific findings. Um, so I think that's where we're starting to see a change, where beforehand there wasn't things like ComSciCon Canada. In fact, uh, Alex and I were the first cohort to go over to the States um, to get that training. So